Meeting here at chapel this morning reminds me of the last time we all came together here for the revelry of the facultones, a tradition I know we all enjoy. It may seem odd for a Jewish person to enjoy Christmas carols, but I love the spirit of the holiday season. And as someone who has sung in choirs and choruses over the years, I always relish both the sacred music and the popular tunes that mark this time of year. Over these last couple of weeks since we went on break, I was struck by some lyrics that may sound cliched, yet resonated deeply for me. Words we heard Mrs. Hamilton sing. Faithful friends who are dear to us, gather near to us once more. Had particular meaning as Mrs. Melvoin and I went back home to Chicago, where we grew up, to join with family and friends. We all experience different rhythms for the holidays, but they all have meaning. And I hope you boys realize what you have and hold fast to them. Some of us come from large, extended families with generations gathering. Some have much smaller family units, some a single parent. For some of us, the holidays now past centered on church and a holy day. For others, the celebrations were secular. But whatever your traditions, I urge you to recognize and cherish the traditions and the continuity. As that carol continues, through the years we all will be together if the fates allow. My family's break was different this year. As many of you know, my father passed away last March at the age of 83. So this was the first holiday season where we had to come to grips with his absence. Our traditions of the season are not unusual as far as I know. Family card games, street hockey not in the driveway, ping pong tournaments in the basement, enjoying seasonal meals, special treats, conversations around the dinner table, watching the Bears lose again. But those are our traditions, and I guess that's what gives them meaning. So we had some adjusting to do this year, yet that was all the more reason to make sure that we gathered as a family. In a year of change, the continuity mattered. In fact, it mattered all the more. And the holidays are about both family and friends, and we made sure that we could spend time with our old friends back home as well. We have been very lucky. Many of our oldest and best friends still live in the Chicago area and have been blessed with good health and strong marriages. So I still see my buddies John and Mark, guys who are not only my closest friends and teammates in high school, but with whom I went to grade school. At one stage in our lives, we came back to the holidays from college and exchanged stories. Then we watched careers and marriages begin. We have watched each other's kids grow up. Now we bring together our kids and their young kids, a gathering of the different generations, a continuity that deepens our relationships, even as we move to next stages of our own careers and lives. But back to family. As I noted, this year was different without my dad. And my mom has made valiant efforts in recent months to go through files and cabinets looking at dad's stuff. After, after all, after 62 years of marriage, there can be a lot of stuff. Figuring out what to save and what to cast out. There was clothing to send to Goodwill. There was fly tying equipment to give to a couple fishing buddies. There were tons of files from his half century of practicing law that could now be tossed. Yet there were also boxes of memorabilia for my mom and for us kids to look through. And in this effort came a new wrinkle, a new purpose to this holiday season. As you boys know, I am a longtime history teacher and a student of history. When I taught American history for about 15 years, I always encouraged my students to do their term papers on local history or personal family history. The world has seen more than enough research papers on Pearl Harbor or the Cuban Missile Crisis. Not that these do not mark important events in American history, but they don't connect directly to a student's life. But your family history is yours alone and can have great meaning. The letters your grandfather wrote home during his time in World War II or the Korean conflict. The path of your family's migration to America, whether in the 17th century or just a generation ago. Your family may have a treasure trove of records or documents that help you understand who you are and where you have come from. And part of my vacation this year came in uncovering some of my own past, 
because my mother asked us to look through files in the basement back home. Some of what we uncovered provided a glimpse of my father's path through school. I held in my hand the program from his eighth grade graduation in 1942 and from the confirmation from his temple two years later. I knew that he had enjoyed theater. Now I held in my hands a clipping from a story about a show in which he played a lead in high school. Going back a generation, I saw a picture of his grandfather, after whom I was named. I looked at pictures of his mother, my grandmother, as a little girl. Now none of this is earth shattering, I know, but it connected me to my past in a way that had not happened before. It also humanized my father in a different way, especially when I read his report card from fifth grade. I think you'll appreciate this. He will be a more helpful member of the group when he talks less to his neighbors. More seriously, I have held in my hands the speech he gave when he became a bar mitzvah at the age of 13. And I have now read a letter from Cambridge, Massachusetts, dated March 18, 1950, sent to his address in Champaign, Illinois, where he was a college senior. Dear Mr. Melvoin, we are pleased to inform you that your application for admission to the Harvard Law School has been approved. I know that much of this stuff is intensely personal. I recognize that. But I want you to realize that each of your families has these histories too. Yes, each is different. Some may come out of files and dusty records that go back decades. Some may come from oral history or tradition. These are no less valuable, no less important. What I want you to realize or remember is that each of you has a legacy, a history, a past, and it ties you into a great circle of being, greater than yourself, and helps you understand your place in the world a little bit better. Even at age 12 or 13, you can become mindful of who you are in a deeper way. And sometimes, you find that your place in the world has greater ties than you might have ever imagined. Here's a little shock I got last week. Amidst the files and records, my mother asked me to check one more box of stuff that she was going to give to my father's sister, my aunt, for it contained a lot of Melvoin family stuff, old photos, various memorabilia. So I dutifully dug in and came across this small envelope that held a little plastic bag holding what looked like a handkerchief with a note in my grandmother's writing. What stopped me cold is that the envelope reads, bracelet and handkerchief woven by Nehru while in prison. So I dove into the note. It turns out that in 1950, my grandparents went on a cruise to Europe and met a woman named Krishna Hudasingh, traveling with her two teenage sons. They became friends on the journey and spoke a great deal about India and the state of the world. At one point, my grandfather, and here I am quoting from this letter, asked if she knew Mahatma Gandhi, to which she replied, he's my uncle. In any event, my grandparents befriended this woman, and at journey's end, she gave them a bracelet, now lost, sadly, but also this small handkerchief that Nehru embroidered while in prison. I know all of you History 3 students, past and present, who have studied the history of India and Pakistan, realize that 1950 represents the early years of Indian independence, and may recall that Nehru had become India's first prime minister. To have this keepsake makes the world a little smaller and also weaves family history into a wider world. I know it doesn't change the world, but it anchors it a bit for me. Again, each of us has a history that helps us to understand who we are and how we got here, literally here, at this point in our lives and our family's life. That Christmas carol I enjoy concludes, through the years we all may be together if the fates allow. As we start into 2014, a new year, we cannot know what the fates will bring. What we can know is that the time to gather with family and friends is precious. The traditions build bonds, that we each can have a role in sustaining all this. Even Apple, of all organizations, understands this. 
Now, maybe so maybe some of you caught an ad last week on TV of the sullen-looking teen, slightly grungy, who gets dragged to his family's holiday gathering, and who quietly uses his iPhone or perhaps his iPad to put together a family video that he surprises everyone with, putting it on the big television screen, drawing everyone's rapt attention and his grandmother's tears. It's a great ad. Great because it tugs powerfully on our emotions, on the importance of family and friends, and traditions, and holiday. I know you boys are still getting the sleep out of your eyes this morning, gearing up for four energetic days and at least one energetic frozen Fenway night. But before we move into exams, I want you to allow yourself to look back a little at the traditions and some of the meaning of the holiday season now ended. I hope you find much to hold on to, even as we move forward into what I hope will be a bright new year for us all. Sixth form.